Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and my goal is to help military veterans navigate their civilian career. Today is episode number 373, Navigating the Military to Civilian Career Transition Webinar. Normally on the show, I interview a military veteran about their civilian career, what they do, how they got there, and advice for other veterans seeking to do the same. This episode is a little bit different. A few weeks ago, I was fortunate to be part of a panel called Off the Page, Navigating the Military to Civilian Career Transition Webinar. This episode is that webinar. I had a blast and loved the insights of both the moderator and the other two guests. So let me give you some context. First of all, this webinar was recorded during one of Kogan Page's Off the Page digital events. It was to promote a new book called Success After Service by Lita Citroen. Longtime listeners will remember Lita from episode number 273, Your Personal Brand, and I'll put that uh, uh, hyperlink in the show notes at beyondtheuniform.org. It's pretty wild for me because that was literally 100 episodes ago. Since then, I've come to consider Lita a dear friend. We've grabbed breakfast and lunch a number of times as she's here in Denver. Um, I say this on the panel, but I'll say it here. Lita's heart is in the right place. No one does work in the veteran space to get rich. Lita's had a very successful career, and her work and this book are in the spirit of of giving back. So it's an honor to help out a friend who is doing great work to help our community. Second, Kevin and Chris, who are on the panel with me, are total badasses. Lita will give you information about their bios at the start of this episode, but I learned a lot from their perspectives. All three of us have had very different journeys, and I think our listeners will appreciate each of these vantage points. We only had 60 minutes for the webinar, but as you'll see, I wish we had three to four hours. So strap in for a lot of information that will help you in your career. Lastly, Lita's book is uh, just came out at the end of October. It's called Success After Service. I'll put links to it in the show notes. Her book is basically what this webinar is on steroids because she, in addition to her own wisdom, met with so many different people to learn and to get information and concisely communicate it to the military community. So if you like this panel, definitely grab your copy. So with that, let's dive in to this webinar. A little bit about me. Um, I am a civilian who about 11 years ago realized that my skills and experience and talents in reputation management and personal branding that I contribute and and work in the in the corporate sector uh, serving there could actually benefit military veterans and service members as they get ready to leave the military. So for about 11 years, I've been speaking at conferences, mentoring and coaching transitioning service members, as well as veterans who've been in the market for a while. You may have seen my popular TEDx where I talk about the process and what I've learned. I have written three books. Success After Service is my third military book, and I'm excited to have it in the hands of anybody who's about 18 to 24 months out of separation, all the way through uh, about a year to three years post-separation. I really look forward to this conversation because not only is it personally meaningful for me, but these are also good friends of mine who have volunteered to share their experience with you. Before I turn it over and, and start getting into the questions, I do want to thank those of you who are watching that are prior military, military spouses, children of military members, because it is really my gratitude for your service that leads me in this direction and has offered me this opportunity to serve you in this way. So thank you for your service and let's get into the content. First up is my good friend and colleague, Kevin Preston. Kevin retired as a Colonel from the Army after 28 years of military service. Today, Kevin serves as Director of Veterans Initiatives at the Walt Disney Company, where he coordinates all veteran activities for Disney businesses, including the very popular Heroes Work Here initiative, 
And he emphasizes staffing, philanthropy, volunteerism, learning, and development in everything he does. Kevin holds an MBA and a master's in education from Loyola University. He received a baccalaureate degree from the George Washington University and has received numerous awards and decorations, not only for his military service, but even after exiting the army. Today, Kevin continues to serve as an outspoken advocate for issues facing our military veterans. So welcome to the conversation, Kevin. How are you doing? Uh, as oh, soon as I turn the, uh, the mute off, I'm doing great. Nice, nice to see you, Lita. Nice to see the other, other panelists, Chris and Justin. <laughs> exactly, I can't wait to hear from everyone. You know, to get us started, Kevin, why don't you tell us a little bit about your transition out of the Army? Sure. Um, you know, I'll, I'll start it off by saying that um, I, I'm not exceptional in anything that I did. Uh, I think my approach to it is skills that everybody who serves in the military possesses. Um, I just started the process very early. So, so what that was, when I was um, about an 04 in the Army, uh, I realized that uh, my time will come to an end at some point. Uh, you have a certain amount of time you can serve in the military. And I knew that I wanted to guide my future. I didn't know what the future was. I didn't know how to get there, but I wanted to be in control of my future. So at a very early point, I started trying to figure out what do you do after the military? We all retire, we're all relatively young and have plenty of time for a second career. So at that time, I've always admired the Walt Disney Company. Um, I came here frequently, I ran the marathons all the time. So I picked up the phone and I called casting, which is Disney Talent Acquisition. And I said, uh, can I talk to somebody who serves in the military? And the nice person said, well, we don't really have that. You can apply for a job. I said, well, I don't want a job. I just want to talk to somebody. So that opened up a, a dialogue with uh, colleagues at Disney. I didn't know anybody um, for about five to six years. And I took a very long approach in doing this um, because I didn't know what to do. I, I never had to apply for a job, never had to do a resume, never had to build a network. So I figure I need more time, not less time. And over that five to six year period, and I'll say, don't, don't, uh, don't feel that's prescriptive. Um, that was my number. You can do it in far less time. Sometimes it takes me a long time to do things. But over that very long period of time, I, I built a network of friends and colleagues in Disney. Uh, one of the pieces of advice was you should probably have an MBA. I had plenty of time, so I got an MBA. And so that was the kind of the, the process that I used to get to Disney. It was a very long path. Uh, people say, how long did it take you to get to Disney? I said, it took one day to get to Disney. It took five years to get to one day. So that was that kind of my quick summary. Uh, but in that five years, I had plenty of time to try and fail and make mistakes and you know reflect and critique um, because time was my friend. It wasn't my enemy. Were you exploring other options at the same time? Or did you, once you kind of set your sight on where you wanted to be, did that sort of become your focus? I would say I casually explored other options, but that was really my focus. And, and at the time you said Disney didn't have a veterans initiative, is that right? Um, they didn't, not at that time. Disney's always been very well connected with the US military. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes back to uh, Walt's brother, Roy, that served in the US Navy, Walt's affinity for, uh, patriotism in the country. So there's always been a very long lineage in this company, um, but there was not a named program uh, earlier. And in 2012, they started Heroes Work Here. I was literally down here to run the marathon and I stopped in to see friends and it's no different than walking next door to see your neighbor. And we're chatting about this and that and the other. And the closing piece of the conversation was, we're starting a veterans program. What, what do you know about veteran employment? Wow. And I said, I know quite a bit because I've done the reverse in the army helping people leaving the army get jobs. And that's what opened the door uh, for the eventual position that I was hired for. So you see a lot of transitioning service members or even folks that have been out in the market for a while that approach a company like um, Disney. What are some of them doing right? And where are they falling short of getting the attention of an employer like Disney? Sure. You know, and, and, and I, I, would, I, would, I would lump in, you know, all these big companies have uh, the similar things. You get hundreds of applicants for jobs, you know, these big name brand companies. 
Um, the things I've seen that have changed over the years is um, one, the preparation. I'm seeing people start the process much earlier um, instead of a couple of days before retirement or separation. Um, they're starting 12, 18, 24 months in advance, uh, which gives plenty of time for coaching and advising and networking. So that, that's been a phenomenal change just since I've left the military. I've seen the transition programs leaving the military uh, improve substantially and introduction of programs like SkillBridge or Fellowship. Um, so those things have been very good additions. The things I see that are pretty chronic with veterans and, and I'll state these are macro statements. Uh, I'm not meaning to cast a blanket over every veteran because it doesn't apply. But the consistent things I see that veterans may struggle with um, is one, the actual task of preparing a resume and one that's appealing to a for-profit corporation. Um, Two, telling your story and building your brand on the resume that makes sense to people that never touched the military. When I talk to veterans, the advice I give is if you stumble across somebody in the talent acquisition process that served in the military, you found the needle in the haystack. Because by and large, no one has ever touched the military that's looked at your resume. So, you know, those two components, the resume is the initial entree. It's that stepping stone into uh, the interview process. Mm -hmm. So the resume piece is, is very important. The next piece is... I, I talk about behavioral elements quite a bit. And when I teach non-veterans and diversity and inclusion and human resources about veterans, um, I approach it from the standpoint of let's put reasons behind behavior because people will look through a lens at a population um, as they're used to looking at it. And if a person comes in and deviates from that, um, that script, all of a sudden they're raising their eyebrows and saying, wait a second, what's wrong? So veterans have a, a unique background that's built in, 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 a, in, a, in a culture um, that I think is one of the most you know, developed cultures in our U.S. society. It's, it's one of the only professions that you, if you choose to, you can live entirely among a like community mm. and never leave that like community. You can live, you can eat, you can shop, you can worship, um, go to school, all in one community. So in, in looking at the behavioral piece, things I talk about is uh, one, I will tell the DNI and HR community, I said, when you see a, a resume, if you identify a veteran, realize this is the first time they've done a resume. Very likely. Doesn't matter if they're 24 or 44. And then I say, the first time you did anything in your life, how well did you do it? <laughs> Juggling, tying your shoes, learning a language. Did you do it well? And they'll generally say, no, I didn't. So I say, just give them a little bit of latitude on the resume. Um, the next piece is the interview preparation. I, I find interviews... Uh, very uncomfortable. Uh, it, it's it's speaking about yourself in the first person. It's talking about what I did. Um, it's it's relating stories that are um, that make sense to those that haven't served. And and many times those are uncomfortable traits for a veteran. If you look at that in isolation, you may interpret this person has a hard time communicating because they're taking a long time to answer questions. Uh, you may interpret they don't have a lot of passion because they're not bounding out of the chair with smiles on their face, which is both, you know, far from the truth. And, you know, once again, I go back to the behavioral piece. I said, well, when you ask a veteran a question, depending on how long they've been out, they're going to take your question and rephrase that in their head to, to find a military experience that makes sense and then translate that experience with no military language back to you. Mm -hmm. So the words you're telling and the story you're telling makes sense. And mentally, it takes some time to go through that. Uh, we're not, once again, as a macro, I don't think we're overtly emotional people. You know, we're happy and sad like everybody else, but we don't show it a lot of times. So if you're not smiling and bounding out of the chair with joy, it doesn't mean you're not excited. It just means we have a different way of displaying our emotions. Those are important, in my opinion, because if you're different than the normal script they see, they may interpret something else. So when you put explanation behind behavior, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know what? I got it. You know, they're going to smile eventually. They're going to relax eventually. When I went for my interview uh, upon leaving the military, uh, I stood behind a chair, uh, not at attention, but not far from it, <clears throat> for the gentleman talking to me because he was senior. He was, well he was very well respected. And that was my way of saying, look, I respect your office. Thank you for being here. I'm not going to come in and slump down the chair without being invited to. The, the last piece I'll talk about, and Lita and I joke about this, and I use the phrase scary veteran. And the scary veteran is, I think we do things as veterans that are entirely unconscious, as unconscious as breathing. Uh, we have experiences that most of society has never conceived or touched. 
the closest they've come is a movie or a news broadcast. And the, the intensity with which we speak, the deliberate nature in which we speak, uh, sometimes the stories we tell mm -hmm. um, can be intimidating to those that have never touched the military. You know, military can talk about world affairs and world views and country views and dealing with cabinet secretaries and all these things that are quite often so far beyond a person who's never touched the military. It's not right or wrong, but I always advise don't be the scary veteran. You got to relate to your audience and to that person in talent acquisition who may be 27 years old mm -hmm. and never touched anything you're talking about. So, you know, be, be, be aware of the scary veteran side because it can, it can come out unintentionally just by the nature of what you've done in your life. You know, and, and, and you and I have talked a lot about that. One of the things I really appreciate having spent probably more than 300 hours mentoring and coaching uh, transitioning service members and veterans is the directness, the candor with which we communicate. And it took me by surprise at first how blunt some of these individuals would be. But I learned that it was actually a very natural style for me. So I returned that. And I know as a civilian who coaches executives, I have to then switch gears and make sure that I speak in a different narrative because the civilian narrative is more relational, experiential, um, you know, it, it includes a lot more feelings, words, and we might not be as direct. So I love that you mentioned that. Any, any last thoughts before we move on? Because I know we're going to come back and I'm sure the audience has questions they're already forming. But any last thoughts before we move? Yeah, you know, just, just a, a quick closing comment. I would say don't be afraid to reach for your dreams. You may not know what your dreams are and at a finite point and I want to be at this place at this time. But my, my dreams were at one point that I served for 28 years. Uh, I did that. I didn't want to do that again. Um, I didn't want to be a contractor. I didn't want to work um, on the federal side. Nothing wrong with that at all. But that's just, just not what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do something else. And I wasn't quite sure what it was, but I knew there were steps involved in it. And I started walking down a path, not quite seeing the end goal. But, you know, that was kind of my dream and vision. And the further I got down the path, the closer it got. And all these little small details added up to uh, one large event. So don't be scared to dream about what you want because there, there's some great jobs out there across all facets of for-profit, non-profit, government, state, federal, contract, all sorts of good stuff out there for you. Excellent. Don't forget to dream. Great advice. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, we're going to move on and now hear from Justin Nasiri. Justin is the founder and host of the very popular Beyond the, po Beyond the Uniform podcast. Previously, he founded Storybox, which is a venture-backed marketing technology company that was used by many Fortune 500 companies. He worked as a consultant at McKinsey and was an officer in the Navy onboard submarines. Justin holds a master's in business administration from Stanford Graduate School of Business and a BS in engine, electrical engineering, that's a mouthful, from the United States Naval Academy. Welcome, Justin. Thank you. How so, are you doing? Thank you. Great. It's good to see you, Lita. You as well. Tell us a little bit about your military transition and why you decided to pursue entrepreneurship after the military. Yeah, so I served on submarines for five years. I knew I was going to get out at that point, but I didn't really know what I was going to do afterwards. And uh, most of my peers that that um, were in submarines would go on to civilian nuclear power plants or defense contracting. I knew I didn't want to do those. And so I bought myself some time by going to business school. And it was, um, in retrospect, a really good decision for me because even though I didn't realize it at the time, I needed a couple of years to decompress and to, to reorient myself to my new post-military life. And so while I was at business school, I, I thought I would go into consulting with McKinsey and Company, uh, did my internship there, accepted an offer there. And this was in 2009 when the economy took a tumble. And so I had about nine months between business school and starting with consulting. And so um, I thought, you know, I might as well just play around with something and started to toy with an idea that became a company and then went to McKinsey and said, hey, I'm going to pursue this instead. And that really started my 10 plus year path with entrepreneurship. 
And um, it's, it's been a roller coaster of raising money and growing a team and then shrinking a team and pivoting. It's, it's really um, hard to explain the emotional and physical toll, both positive and negative that that path has caused me. But, um, you know, it's also led to, we, we had 35 Fortune 500 companies, including Disney, using our software. And it was pretty incredible to think this idea that started literally as a sketch on a piece of paper eventually materialized into this living object that was utilized by people around the world. That's such a fascinating story. And we know that a lot of um, veterans come out of the military and pursue entrepreneurship and are very well poised to do so. Why do you think veterans make successful entrepreneurs? So with the, you know, with the podcast Beyond the Uniform, I've interviewed over 375 military veterans at this point, and um, I've seen lots of different flavors of entrepreneurs. And that's, that's just one thing that I'd want to share with, with webinar attendees today is there, there's no one path. I have interviewed veterans who started companies while on active duty. Um, Brian Rutherford is a, is a um, uh, military member who started a wine company with his brother and he, he runs it while in the military. There's many examples of people who start their entrepreneurial journey on uh, active duty. Uh, recently, I in interviewed this, this uh, gentleman, Christian Sands, who started a drone technology company called Skycatch. And he left the military. He actually worked at Disney as well, but he had about 10 years of experience post-military before he started this very successful company. So there's many different paths. I think the common trend that I see is that um, I think that the, in the military, we are very well trained to say, look, this is the objective. These are the limited resources you have, figure it out. Message to Garcia, break through walls to make it happen. And day to day, that's been my experience with entrepreneurship is a tremendous amount of ambiguity and having to achieve an objective. And I think that most people who are not familiar with the military, they may interpret it as like, well, the military tells you what to do and you go and do it. That, that's not been my experience and most of the experience of the veterans I've interviewed, which is there's oftentimes an extreme amount of ambiguity and a variety of ways to achieve an objective and usually incredible obstacles to overcome on the way to do so. And that that's, makes you pretty well suited for entrepreneurship. What, one other thing I'll say is that um, when I was raising money, I, I've raised about $3 million in capital. Um, I do think that that helps. A lot of the investors who wrote large checks said, look, I know that you may not have as much business experience of people we've invested in, but we know that you've got integrity. We know that you've got um, maybe a, a, a notch above the average person in terms of credibility that we, we trust you. And I think that, that veterans will experience that as well, that level of trust in uh, the integrity and the honesty that you bring to any transaction or venture. And I love what you just said. And, and one of the things I'm so proud about with Success After Service, which all three of you contributed to, is that we talk about the various paths, right? Because employment is certainly a path. Education is a viable path, as both you and Kevin have, Kevin have talked about, going and getting additional education, whether it was after military service or, or while you were still active duty. And I know Chris will talk about that too. But there's also this path to entrepreneurship. And one of the things that came up a lot when, when I was writing the book is the relationship piece. You talk about going and getting investor money or building the resources on the other side of the military. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship piece that somebody needs to have in place, the networking to be able to be a successful entrepreneur? It's, you know, it's definitely tainted by my own experience. One thing I'm, I'm grateful for with business school is that it instantly gave me a network of classmates and then the broader alumni ecosystem. And, and honestly, you know, when I raised my first round of $350,000, I, I, you know, met with maybe 60 different people to make that happen. And I, it's difficult to imagine having more than three or four of those meetings without that network. Almost all of them were leaning on Stanford's network and the people that I knew there. Um, and so that was an asset for me in building relationships. And again, many different paths. There are people who have come straight out of active duty and done the same thing without it. But in my case, it was really helpful. 
Um, and I'll, I'll take it a step further in that um, there's part of me that wishes out of business school, I would have, maybe not with McKinsey, maybe with McKinsey, but with some other company established another network or maybe even two by working at a few different companies. And not only would I then have had, you know, let's say if I worked at Facebook, I would have the Facebook community and that network and that in to get an introduction, which would have been helpful. But I also would have had experience working in a normal company, which I, I never really had. And, and the reason why I think that's so important is I think that when you start a company, you have room to innovate in one very narrow space. You're doing something new, but the extent to which you can beg, borrow, or steal from other companies for everything else is really helpful. So like at this point, Kevin has a lot of experience at Disney. He knows how they hire, he knows how they fire, he knows how they do benefits, he knows all of these litany of things that you'll need to know in order to effectively run a company. He doesn't have to make it up on the go because he's had multiple years working at a very well-established company. And that's one other thing in addition to the relationships that I think I underestimated at the time is like, well, you know, maybe if I worked two years somewhere, Yes, I would have sacrificed those two years building my company, but I think it would have paid dividends in understanding how things work. And I didn't really have that. So I was creating everything from scratch for my own company. I hear you on that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you've interviewed hundreds of, of people, professionals, military veterans, military advocates. I know I was fortunate to be on Beyond the Uniform, and I still get people who reach out to me because they heard that interview. So with all of those interviews, is there a common bit of advice that you have heard from the people you've spoken with that our transitioning service members or maybe veterans that are listening today can benefit from? Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say too, at, at the start, I, I interviewed Lita for episode 273 and have had breakfast and lunch with her since then. And she is, she's the real deal. Her heart is in the right place. No one enters this space to get, to, to get rich. And she has leveraged a tremendously successful career to give back to a community that, that matters to both of us. And so I really appreciate that. Um, so in the 375 interviews I've, I've had, um, a couple trends come through um, and I'll just kind of pepper this and we can go into it in the Q&A Q if people want to go deeper. Um, one is the transition that we experience from the military to the civilian career. Most of us will go through a similar transitions, maybe not as dramatic, but similar transitions six to 12 times in our career. We will reinvent ourselves. We'll switch companies. It's not a one-time thing. So it's worth building up this expertise. It's worth actually getting good at making these career transitions because it's not going to be the last time that you do it. A second thing that I learned from Andy Chan, who I, I knew from Stanford, he was their career um, uh, guidance counselor, and I had him on the show. One of the best pieces of advice I've heard is don't try to figure out what you're going to do. Try to figure out what you're not going to do. Start closing doors as quickly as possible. And it can be overwhelming to figure out from a thousand different career options what you're going to do. Start, you know, maybe say, figuring out big or small company and closing a door there, maybe industries, maybe functional roles, but don't put so much pressure on you to figure out the ideal, the, the, the dream job that you're going to get. Start ruling things out and narrowing that scope. And, and a third piece on that is very often veterans will say, hey, I'm a Swiss army knife. I will go anywhere, I'll do anything, thinking that an openness to possibility makes things easier. And time and time again on the show, we see that um, that actually makes it harder for people to help you. And we have a lot of so sound bites on the show where someone says, this is what I did, I'm looking for this size company in this geographic area, in this functional role. And as soon as someone says that, my, my mental Rolodex starts spinning and I'm like, this is the person I can put you in touch with. But when someone says, I'll go anywhere, do anything, I really want to help the person, but I, I can't really narrow that down. They're not spoon feeding me in a way to make this actionable. People are so busy. They want to help you, but you have to make it easier. Wow. Um, and then, yeah, yep. Two, just two last things. Oh, um, two, two last things that I'll just say. One is um, I think entitlement is the biggest threat to our military community. I think that on active duty, we're told that people want to hire us and we're going to have a breeze finding our job. 
most of the people I've, I've interviewed found the job search process to be much longer and much more difficult than they expected. So don't underestimate it. And then lastly, self-knowledge is the most important piece of advice that people give me. Um, the extent to which you understand yourself and what you're looking for, it makes everything else easier. Oh, fantastic. I'm sure our audience has tons of questions for you. Thank you so much, Justin. And if you'll just hold tight, we'll come back to you in just a moment. But last but not least, I want to introduce Chris Sanchez. When he retired in 2017, Chris had served 23 years in the Navy as a SEAL. He completed multiple overseas tours to Iraq, Afghanistan, South and Southeast Asia, and earned a master's degree in data science along the way. Currently, Chris works at Gartner on the federal supply chain team and will soon be transitioning into a machine learning engineer data scientist role. He's an active advocate for veterans and spends many, many hours volunteering his time, mentoring and serving and assisting veterans in the civilian sector. Welcome, Chris. Hey, Lita, thanks for having me. No problem. Can you talk a little bit about your transition? And, and I know you and I have, have discussed, you had some ups and downs along the way as you left the Navy. Can you share a little bit of that? Absolutely. Uh, uh, for the audience's sake, though, I do want to say this, that if you heard nothing else, just listen to what Kevin <laughs> and uh, Justin said, and you're good. You don't have to listen to anything else that I have to say. Those two guys right there, it just nailed it. So if you have this recording, I would actually watch that a few times because like they dropped, they dropped some gold uh, nuggets. And if I had, uh, I guess, been in the in the mind to 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 take on that advice when I was transitioning, I think that would have everything that they had to say would have helped me uh, greatly. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, tag on to something though that Justin said, which is. Uh, the reason why I had a difficult time transitioning, and it's been it's been three years now, and I'm just now kind of on that, uh, I don't want to call it a glide slope, but I'm just now seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and the reason why it was difficult was because my conception of reality did not meet my expectations, right? I did, I didn't feel entitled, but I definitely felt like, oh, Navy SEAL background, master's degree in data science from Berkeley, the world, all they want to talk about is data these days. Like who's not going to want that combination, you know? Um, so it wasn't, I didn't, I don't think I had an arrogant approach to it, but I had a very naive approach to how to find a job. And, you know, I put together a resume. I did a little bit of like um, self-study on interviewing. I didn't go through some of the special operations um, transition programs that were available to me. I didn't think I needed them. I was like, oh, I'll be good, you know? Uh, and I wasn't good. And <laughs> I, I uh, went on terminal leave in August of 17. And, uh, you know, I knew I had to find something by January. I didn't really start looking until the end of November, um, which I know that sounds crazy, right? Uh, I didn't know at the time. And uh, I remember calling, so this is how I met you, Lita. I remember calling you through Veterati which if, you, if, if you're listening and, and you're a veteran or an active duty, Veterati is, is, is key. You can get so many uh, informational interviews through that. So that, there's a plug for Veterati. But that's how I met you. And I was like low. I was in my lowest of lows, you know, going looking for a job in December. Like, again, something I didn't know, like that's not a great time uh, to be looking. And I remember telling you like, oh, I've only gotten three interviews. And you're like, you've got three interviews in the month of December. <laughs> you know how good that is? And like you provided me that perspective. And that was like the first time where I was like, oh, there's a reality out there that like I am not tuned into. Like I just, I'm missing it. And I ended up landing something in February, but it was a job, right? And I wasn't looking for a job, but I was painted into a corner and I was like, I got to take that, you know? And so I was one of those, Veteran statistics, you know, I didn't last longer than I think eight months there. And I was, you know, on to, on to something else. So out of all that, I mean, there's so many lessons to be learned uh, over the last three years, but I, I, I just want to go back to what Justin and, and Kevin were saying that Kevin did what I didn't do. Um, he called Disney. <laughs> he called the company that he wanted to eventually, you know, land at, you know, years before he actually needed to actually you know, uh, land there. 
And I think that's something I would have done too, but I didn't have a conception of really what I wanted to do, right? I knew it was data science, but I didn't know about any companies that I wanted to work out any type of roles. And so it wasn't, uh, I didn't think that, oh, I should probably go talk to a bunch of companies. Like that wasn't just part of my, you know, it wasn't part of my mindset. So, you know, the key to really turning that, getting a good site picture, like building out like your, your, your target package, if you will, is doing, you know, those informational interviews, uh, looking at companies, talking to people in the roles that you eventually want to look at. Because like, like Justin said, I, from doing that process, eventually I found out, oh, I don't want to do that. Like, I definitely don't want to go into sales, selling computers, because that sounds, you know, terrible, right? Um, uh, but like building up that site picture while you have time is just so key. So I'll kind of leave it at that. Well, Chris, and, and I think you're under you're underselling yourself because I think you represent who many veterans are. And so your message of while it might not have been the smoothest glide into where you are now, it is very classic and and where a lot of them struggle and you and I both coach and mentor a lot of veterans is yeah. we hear that, you know, everybody tells me they're going to be falling at my feet and everyone's going to want to hire me. So there is almost a, a naivete or an entitlement, as Justin said, to just expecting that they're going to find you. Did social media play a role in helping you become marketable? And, and I know we haven't talked much about programs like LinkedIn or online uh, platforms, but was that helpful in helping you build your visibility to be attractive to employers? I don't know. I mean, to this day, I don't know that I've cracked the LinkedIn nut, but I will say it initially it kind of gave me a false sense of security because like I said, I didn't start looking for a role until November uh, and I was getting out, you know, after term I'll leave in December. Um, but the day after, like I completely redid my LinkedIn profile, I had someone reach out to me I'm like, hey, I just saw your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> like, you got to go do this interview with my CEO at the, you know, is that a startup for a chief of staff position? And I was like, yeah, of course I'll go do that. And I was like, oh, this is going to be easy. I'm going to get tons of requests like this, you know? <laughs> um, that was the only time that that happened. Uh, I didn't end up picking up that, that chief of staff role. Um, but that kind of like, for me, that clued me in like, oh, people do use this as a tool. And I've used it, I would say, quite successfully in my search for reaching out for, because the idea of just like submitting a resume through, you know, through the ATS system, like I, I kind of knew like, oh, that's not a good way to find a job. So I, inst uh, I would reach out to like talent acquisition people, recruiters or hiring managers when I could find them through LinkedIn. And that was, that's how I found a lot of the interviews and, and some of the jobs um, that I found over the course of the three years. So I, I would definitely say that LinkedIn is, is a very uh, useful tool. Um, I can't comment on, on any others because I don't. You know, okay. Well, what is one thing when you look back that you did right in the in the three years since you've left the Navy? What's one thing you can say I absolutely did that right? Yeah, I mean, to be cheeky, I would say uh, I leveraged the heck out of Veterati, right? So I talked to like 30 different people uh, on that platform, which was, you know, I eventually learned how to do that because like that really shaped for me, like what reality looks like on the outside, what to expect. I'm talking like in terms of salary, roles, uh, functions at companies. Uh, it, that was that was really good. But I'm actually gonna um, make it more concrete with what um, you know Justin was saying. I think what I did right overall was I didn't give up. Like I didn't give up on the dream that. What I really, ultimately, what I really wanted to do was to break into data science and do some, and, and get into, into machine learning and artificial intelligence. And there's so many factors that go into transition. Like it's, it's kind of a, I was thinking about, it's kind of a difficult topic to, to talk about because it's so complex. Like there's right. so many factors that go into it. You know, there's family, geography, you know, personality types. Um, and it's, so it's, 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 it's a lot to, you know, to take on. And I, you know, 
I, I'm kind of institutionalized, right? I've, I've been in one organization for 20 years, you know, 20 plus years. So that's, that's learning a way of doing, of, of, of what life is like, you know. On top of that, I'm the sole breadwinner. So getting out, I couldn't just like pivot and like, I wanna take an internship role somewhere for six months, you know, and learn how to do data science. Like I couldn't do that, right? Um, and so I had, I found myself taking a role that I didn't wanna take. And then I found myself getting into sales because like, you know what? I need to make a lot of money in a short amount of time. And I don't have any great startup ideas, so I'm going to go into sales, right? And I did that for, you know, going on, on two years now. But deep down, like, that was never satisfying. And I, it was always this data science machine learning thing that it was kind of at the periphery. And I was like, well... You know, I'm going to go be a chief of staff because I'll be a chief of staff at a tech company because I have this background. Um, and, and that I just didn't get any traction with that. And it wasn't until I started getting in my mind, like, you know what, maybe you should actually just, you know, go be a data scientist, like just drop everything else and go do it. And, and, and that's, that's what I'm doing right now. And I, it's like, everything's starting to click. I'm, I'm starting to get I'm not even looking for a job right now. <laughs> but I'm starting to get people asking me for about roles and things. I'm like, hey, hey, hey I'll, I'll talk to you in like three, three months. Let me let me get through what I need to right now. So bottom line is like if you think of like, oh, I want to be a painter someday, well, I can't do that because it's you know it doesn't pay the bills or whatever. Like I would be, I would strongly recommend you to not just blow that off. To maybe you have to take an intermediate role in between, you know, now and then. But, but don't give up on that. Like I would, I would strongly hold on to that uh, for just sheer, you know, life satisfaction and just li living a fulfilling, fulfilling life. Excellent, excellent. Well, we've heard very different paths here. We've heard a path direct into an employer that you wanted to work with. Um, I, I, it sounds like all roads lead to the magic kingdom according to the other panelists as well. But you know Kevin's story of, of coming out of the army and knowing who he wanted to work with and spending years cultivating that relationship. We've heard from Justin who talked about going from military to education to entrepreneurship, which is a very common path and being very successful there. And Chris who graciously shared some bumps and struggles, but really only in a very short period of time to be able to find where he wanted to land. I'd like to open it up to the other panelists to comment or add thoughts to what somebody else may have shared. Kevin, do you have anything to tag on to what Justin or Chris shared? And I see you're muted, so we'll definitely want to unmute you. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting when you get on these panels that you know we, you combine all these people and you get a great picture. Uh, and you know, Justin has a phenomenal perspective. Chris has a great perspective, and you put this whole thing together, and you get you know a nice picture. Of, of what transition can look like. You know, I'd probably say the, the, a couple of things that popped into my head, and this was just my own learnings along the way that when I started my process of transition, I was, uh, I was focused on salary. And I always said, I don't think I'm any more or less materialistic than your average person is. And, and looking back, I think that was the only thing I could focus on that made sense to me, that I understood what I made in the military, I could, I could kind of draw a line over to the civilian side. So I think it was just something that made sense. And I talked to a retired Sergeant Major one time and he had some of the best advice I received. And he said, don't worry about money. Mm. I said, why not? He said, money's going to find you. You don't have to find it. And it was such freeing advice. And, and, and I don't think he knew the impact of what he said. Mm. Because if you start peeling that onion back and, you know, going in the interview process, you know, if you are generally entirely money motivated, that's your sole focus in life. Well, somebody else offers you $10,000 more, you're going to leave. Right. But it's the person that's passionate about a job or a culture or a company or an industry. And then money is, is somewhere down the line. So, you know, I would just, I would offer that was a learning that I had of, don't worry about the money. The money is going to find you. You don't need to chase it. And if you're chasing it, it's going to drive behaviors that are probably not going to help, help you to get to where you want to go. Uh, you know, I'll go back to find what you enjoy, just like Chris said. Uh, you know, I've, I've joked that people in talent acquisition, they're like, they're like police officers. They have a, uh, 
a sense when somebody is fudging the truth because they talk to thousands of people. Mm. And, you know, you, you cannot fake passion. You cannot fake excitement. So when you find what excites you and what you have a passion about, it comes through in the interview and the job acquisition process and how you speak to people. It's so, yeah, I would say that's a, that's an important piece for me is find what you love and go after it and don't stop pursuing it until you get it. You know, Kevin, I, I just want to give a, a little plug to something you told me years ago. Actually, I think I was writing my first military book, Your Next Mission. And I asked you, what advice would you have for somebody transitioning? And you said, don't forget to dream that so often when you leave the military, the, the focus is on getting that job, putting the resume together, starting to you know start pounding the pavement with resumes. And you said, we don't learn how to dream. And the military is so mission focused that you said, if you can give them one piece of advice, it's, it's make sure they, they remember they get to dream about what they want, not just take what they get. And I, that's just always stuck with me. So thank you for adding those thoughts. Yeah, just, no, thank you. Justin, did you have anything you wanted to add to either what Chris said or pick up on something Kevin mentioned? Just two small things. I First of all, I just appreciate Chris's honesty and humility. Um, I think that his story is more representative than not, but it's mm -hmm. it's just refreshing to have someone who's so open about a rocky road and, it, and it's, it's, not, it's not that uncommon. Mm -hmm. And so I, I appreciate that. And then the one thing I just wanted to say with Kevin is... Um, when, you know, he's very unusual in a sense of looking forward six years. I, I rarely hear of that, but that gives him a tremendous amount of power. And he had a great little soundbite where he said with to this person at Disney, I'm not looking for a job. I'm just looking for advice. And I found in, uh, in dating, in fundraising, in job search, desperation, it just really sucks your power. But when you have, you know, if you're employed in the military or elsewhere, it gives you so much power to be choosy and to have conversations without any neediness. You don't really need a job. It can be more casual. It can be the slow burn like Kevin did where you're building a relationship. And then four or five years later, that leads to something and doesn't always lead to something, but it's much less transactional. And I think that that resonates with most veterans who are turned off by sales or networking. It's just much more about building a relationship, which I think they'll excel at. I love that advice. Yes. And networking is what got us here. So I, I appreciate you all in my network for sure. Chris, any thoughts on something that may have just been shared or something they, they shared earlier? Yeah. Um, regarding Kevin's uh, comments about salary. Uh, I, you know, we talk about me having a rocky road and it certainly was. Um, but like, like when I look back, like the first job that I had, it was, it was pretty dang good. Like in, in all aspects, right. It was a great role great benefits, great comp, um, just wasn't happy, you know, ultimately with the company. And then the company that I'm with now, you know, last year, like I made more money than I've ever made in my entire life. So, but when I look back at the last three years, like <laughs> I was professionally just miserable, you know, uh, and, and doing four job searches over the last three years is, is, is emotionally, you know, it's taxing, you know, it's wearing. Um, so, you know, to, to, to both their comments, it's like money definitely plays a factor. You know, I like what Les Brown said. He's like, you know, you don't need money, but it sure is like oxygen. <laughs> you know, um, it, 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 you, you kind of need it, right? In, in, in many just different aspects, but um, the finding out, you know, what you really like doing and, and what's going to, you know, fulfill you and, and, and working for a company that's, you know, that has a mission to it, you know, and you feel like you're doing some good in the world plays a huge, plays a huge factor. Well, and I'll, I'll just kind of wrap up with a comment that I heard years ago by somebody who was transitioning. And he said, you know, I know you, Lita, you're out there talking to the employers and helping them understand who the military veteran is. He said, please remind them we're not looking for charity. We're not looking for a handout. We're looking to do something that matters, to do work that's meaningful. And in, when employers tie that job uh, to, to a mission, to a purpose, that veteran will be loyal and resilient and adaptable and committed in the same way that they were perhaps um, when they served a different calling. So I wanna thank all of you. I know we've got some questions. I know some questions came in online before the webinar and Courtney has those prepared, but I really wanna thank each of you. You've shared your personal stories. You've given a tremendous amount of insight. 
you shared a lot of that when I was writing this book. And I know this book is going to be successful because of your contribution. And I just want to thank you personally for making time and being vulnerable and letting us have a conversation that's going to serve so many. I do this work, as was mentioned, not because you make money teaching veterans how to transition, but because this is a way that I can say thank you. Uh, my mother was raised in communist Hungary and at a very early age taught me that freedom doesn't come for free. And the work you've done, the service that you gave our nation is what enables me to do the work that I do and live in this beautiful country and serve the way I get to. So thank you for that. Beyond the Uniform is written and produced by me, Justin Asiri, with help from our Chief of Staff, Steve Bain, our Editor, Kathleen Dillon, and our Head of Social Media, Janelle Hanf. We are an all-volunteer organization and would greatly appreciate your help in any of the following three ways. First of all, spread the word. Beyond the Uniform has over 360 podcast episodes and 15 on-demand webinars, all offered for free. Help us spread the word on social media and military bases or whatever gets the resource in front of the men and women who need it. Positive reviews on iTunes go a long way towards this as well. Second of all, sponsorship. Beyond the Uniform relies on financial sp sponsorship to keep us going. There is so much more we'd like to do as well, but just don't have nearly the resources to do so. If you know of a company that would advertise in any way with Beyond the Uniform, please send them our way. Third of all, donations. If you're in a financial, financial position to donate, you can find more information on the support section of our website. At our website, beyondtheuniform.org, you'll find over 360 episodes categorized by industry, functional role, and more. You'll also find both free and for purchase resources that take a deeper dive on topics related to career growth. Thank you for your support as we aim to help members of the military community thrive in their post-military career and life.